King Herod heard of the disciples preaching, for Jesus' name had become known. Some were saying, John the baptizer has been raised from the dead, and for this reason these powers are at work in him. But others said, it is Elijah. And others said, it is a prophet, like one of the prophets of old. But when Herod heard of it, he said, John, whom I beheaded, has been raised. For Herod himself had sent men who arrested John, bound him, and put him in prison on account of Herodias, his brother Philip's wife, because Herod had married her. For John had been telling Herod, it is not lawful for you to have your brother's wife. And Herodias had a grudge against him and wanted to kill him. But she could not, for Herod feared John, knowing that he was a righteous and holy man, and he protected him. When he heard him, he was greatly perplexed, and yet he liked to listen to him. But an opportunity came when Herod, on his birthday, gave a banquet for his courtiers and officers and for the leaders of Galilee. When his daughter Herodias came in and danced, she pleased Herod and his guests, and the king said to the girl, Ask me for whatever you wish, and I will give it. And he solemnly swore to her, Whatever you ask me, I will give you even half of my kingdom. She went out and said to her mother, What should I ask for? She replied, The head of John the baptizer. Immediately she rushed back to the king and requested, I want you to give me at once the head of John the Baptist on a platter. The king was deeply grieved, yet out of regard for his oaths and for his guests, he did not want to refuse her. Immediately the king sent a soldier of the guard with orders to bring John's head. He went and beheaded him in the prison, brought his head on the platter, and gave it to the girl. Then the girl gave it to her mother. When his disciples heard about it, they came and took his body and laid it in a tomb. The Gospel of our Lord. Praise to you, O Christ. You may be seated. Well, that feels like some great good news, doesn't it? <laughs> when I first came to LCCK back in February for our meet and greet before you all voted to call me as your next pastor, I stood at the pulpit and in front of my laptop for our Zoom session and tried to condense my whole life into about five minutes, just so you could get to know me a little bit more before prayerfully deciding to call me as your pastor and for me, so much of my own faith story and ministry and call is all wrapped up in the ways in which we regularly try to convince ourselves that we are not the ones God is looking for in any particular situation. We often worry that we are not educated enough in our faith tradition to share our personal faith stories with others. We often find ourselves feeling inadequate when faced with neighbors in serious need. We often feel like we don't have the credentials to make the right choices in our lives, especially the choices that God is calling us to. And we're not the only ones who experience this, right? We see this throughout scripture. Moses, who tries to convince God that he is not eloquent enough to lead God's people out of Egypt, which of course he does in the most eloquent way possible. Jeremiah, who is interrupted by God in his claim that he is just a boy and cannot be a prophet speaking truths about God and about God's people to Israel. Jonah literally gets eaten by a giant fish in his attempt to avoid God's action in his life. That is a kind of avoidance that sometimes I might aspire to. <laughs> With our readings today, we see two very different ways in which people are given outs to following God's commands to love God and to love our neighbor. With the prophet Amos and the priest Amaziah, we witness God's justice along God's plumb line, which is basically, for those of you who know construction things, apparently it's a way to keep, make sure a wall is straight, 
I had never had to do that, and I think if I did, none of my walls in my house would be straight, and we're new homeowners, so they might not be anyway. <laughs> <laughs> but we see with Amos that he is trying to speak God's truth to the people in Bethel, particularly in our reading today, and then we also see that with Herod and John the Baptist, we kind of witness what we can all probably assume is the opposite of God's justice. I have a lot of mixed feelings about our gospel reading from Mark today, and I think that we can put it most simply with the word gruesome. It seems right out of Game of Thrones, our gospel today is gruesome, it's violent, it's gross, and honestly, it's just sad. And it would be easier to skip over our gospel reading and maybe just focus in on the wonderful promises of Ephesians today. But the gospel writer Mark doesn't want us to skip over this. Between the time in Mark when Jesus sends his disciples out and when they return, we have this interlude, this story, this reminder of the way in which human justice often plays out in the world. Often when this story is told, Herod's new wife and daughter slash niece, we don't know the exact timeline of their marriage, so I always wonder, is she a stepdaughter who was once Herod's niece or his actual daughter? They're painted as the main villains here. Herod is just a foolish king who doesn't want to look bad. And although Mark tells us that Herod found John interesting, and believed him to be a righteous and honorable man, Herod does still arrest him. John is imprisoned by Herod and kept there, away from his followers, from his disciples, away from the masses, who might find John's harsh words of judgment, punishment, and consequences for the king to be maybe a bit too interesting. And so, although deeply grieved by the request of his daughter slash niece, Herod doesn't think twice in the moment about ending a man's life for the sake of his own ego, his oath, his stake in the power of the land. The king's justice is one where a man who spoke the truth about God and about the world, about the empire, was imprisoned and brutally murdered at the request of a king through the or at the request of a queen through the voice of her daughter, because the king didn't want to lose face in front of his court. He didn't want to give John any more power than he already held by letting him live when such a public drama had already unfolded. But in the face of human justice, God's justice here is that God's message of repentance, of forgiveness of sins, didn't stop with John the Baptist, and so now that Herod is hearing about this Jesus guy preaching the same thing, doing miracles, now Herod is worried and convinced that Jesus is the resurrected John because Herod knows the kind of impossible things that God will do for the sake of the oppressed. I wonder if Herod found himself recollecting on the events that led to John's death and wondering what might have been different if his excuse of oath of selfish ego hadn't steered him so far from God's calling to him? Amos had been sent by God to speak to all of Israel, and in our reading today, specifically to the city of Bethel, he had been sent to share judgment and tell anyone who would listen about the consequences of their hypocrisy and selfishness. Because long before Herod, people still chose, and unfortunately still do choose, ego and selfishness over grace and healing. At this time, like everywhere in the world, for the most part, Israel was ignoring the widow, extorting the poor, and continuing to oppress those on the margins who didn't quite fit just right into the mold of what a good citizen should be. They, like everyone in every place and time, were failing to follow God's commands of love for God and love for our neighbors. And by this point in our scripture, God is just tired of it. I can relate. <laughs> so God sends Amos to speak the hard truths, to call for repentance, and to prophesy of an oncoming exile and punishment 
the consequences for society denying God's justice in the world. And it is probably not surprising that Amos was not especially popular in Bethel or anywhere where he spoke, especially with those in power like Amaziah, the priest, and King Jeroboam. But not only were his words harsh and impossible for them to hear, they seemed completely unrealistic. At the time, King Jeroboam and his reign, those in power enjoyed a prosperous economy. There wasn't a war waging. There wasn't exile on the horizon. By not caring for the poor, the widowed, the stranger, the consequences they saw from their behaviors were wealth and power and comfort. So after hearing Amos, Amaziah tries to just send him on his way. And as I tell him to go do his prophet work somewhere else, somewhere that Amos would probably make a better living, maybe like Judah, where they might hear his harsh words with more interest. But Amos wasn't a professional. He wasn't an educated prophet. He didn't have a family legacy of those who had come before him to give him the reputation that so many prophets and priests like Amaziah would have had. He didn't have the credentials to be saying what he was saying, to be doing what he was doing. And instead of hiding this from Amaziah, it's the fact that he is kind of an outsider that makes this his proof of God's work in him. It's because of the fact that in Amaziah's eyes, Amos is probably inadequate for this, that Amos proves that God is at work because God calls us all to the work of God's justice and grace and healing in this world, whether we're formally theologically educated, whether we feel very adequate or have the credentials to do so. And unlike so many prophets and people who use excuses and reasons why their inadequacy means they are not the right person for the job, Amos uses his as a proof text that God is using a simple herdsman, and as a goat owner, I'm a little bit of a fan of this, of course, that the simple herdsman and dresser of sycamore trees can call out injustice and hopefully call the people listening back into relationship with God. And the hard part, what makes our reading from Amos and our gospel reading today especially hard is because in our stories today from scripture, our heroes, Amos and John the Baptist, aren't successful in the way we would understand them to be. For Amos, the people continue to mistreat the poor and the widowed and the stranger. Israel does end up finding itself in exile. And by the time the Roman Empire has made its way through the Middle East, another prophet, John the Baptist, is killed at the unjust hands of those in power. God calls us into work towards God's justice and grace and healing in the world, and sometimes the point isn't that God thinks that we're going to be immediately successful in this. God calls us in this so that we can try to leave your flock behind like Amos, following God's call to speak truth to injustice, repentance, and forgiveness of sins. Because in this trying, we are part of this incredible, huge, growing family through our own adoption by God through Jesus. Like John, Jesus too faces the injustice of this world, and instead of a gruesome dinner party, it is a gruesome trial and execution on the cross. And like with Herod's obvious belief that of course this new person preaching repentance and forgiveness must be the John he killed, nothing can stop God's plan for the fullness of time, as we are reminded in Ephesians today. God's plan for the fullness of time to gather all things, all people back to God. And so on the cross, Jesus takes this justice of this world, this justice that ignores the widow and extorts the poor and oppresses the marginalized, the kind of justice that tells us that we are not enough, that tells us that we don't have enough, we don't do enough, we need more knowledge, more credentials, whatever it might be to somehow make us this whole person that we are told we might become. And Jesus on the cross flips that justice 
and turns it towards healing and grace and the new life that God gives us in the resurrection. Jesus gives us a justice of life and forgiveness of adoption as children of God destined for grace and love and redemption so that even when it doesn't always work out, even when we don't feel successful in sharing our faith, in caring for our neighbor, in our calling as children of God, we know that God can and does the impossible through us, through even a herdsman, as long as we try. Thanks be to God. Amen.